Hi, Chuck Hinkley here. Um, this is the second video in my series about land use for solar wind power projects versus um, the existing uh, land use uh, for agricultural uh, purposes. Um, the first video is an introduction. Talked a little bit about myself, a little bit why I might know something about this. Um, this video is just the numbers. So uh, very little editorial comment here. In reality, these decisions have a lot more to do than just the numbers. Uh, video four, number three, will, the subject will primarily be, will opportunity knock twice? Why is the solar wind developer knocking on my door? Uh, we'll have another opportunity later. Um, just to put things in perspective of each other, the landowner, and the uh, renewable developer. And video four will be okay. We kind of established the uh, the circumstances uh, around the ask uh, and the economics around the ask. Now, you know what what what? How do we establish a framework to evaluate and and make a decision for a landowner? And their family and their community, um, all of which end up being an important uh, piece of the uh, analysis for folks. So this video happily is just numbers. Uh, numbers are relatively easy to discuss because they're just numbers. So let's just kind of pick through a paper I wrote uh, in March. This is April of 2023. Um, and let's go look at the numbers surrounding uh, the wind farm applicator, the wind farm, the solar application, and uh, the existing agricultural use. Um, I'm using as a representative uh, a case study uh, a uh, corn rotation, a corn corn bean rotation agricultural use in in Indiana. And the solar use in Indiana, um, these uh, this kind of representative case bridges to wind. It bridges to other geographic 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 geographical locations, and also um, to different crops or ag different agricultural uses. Um, so uh, I, here uh, I wrote a uh, another note about a year ago, and found that the typical solar lease would triple the average Indiana farmer's net income when compared with keeping the land in traditional agricultural use, and furthermore that entering into the um, uh, the lease at the time construction commenced in any event uh, would um, would double his uh, the value of his land. Um, so what kind of are the terms and conditions you can expect from a, a typical solar lease, for example, um, and to the extent people want uh, me to talk about wind, le wind leases, I'm, I'm very happy to do that as well. Um, just let me know and I'll make a special video for that. Um, they typically pay about $1,000 an acre. So what do we mean by that? That means for every acre that the solar plant takes uh, out of agricultural use and then, then the solar company rents, um, they pay about $1,000 an acre over the 35 years. So they, the, the, the initial year one rent may start much, much less than um, $1,000, say $800, $850, but if there's escalation factor, kind of on average, you could expect kind of $1,000 to $1,200 on average over the 35 years. Uh, and that's paid per year. So the, the farm goes, the, the, the solar project goes into commercial operation, and um, uh, every year you get paid $1,000 an acre. Now, there are some nuances here. So what about land that the landowner owns that's in the same parcel, but there's no panels on it. Can that land get carved out? Does that land attract a different rate? Um, and the answer is all of the above. So there are 
kind of around the edges um, differences between the different leases and uh, what's on offer. Uh, but let's just, for the sake of this um, discussion, say that we are assuming there's a thousand dollars an acre, uh, that uh, there's some sort of some sort of uh, minor um, escalation, and let's assume the term is 35 years. Um, so just to put that in perspective, if you have a large landowner that say is a thousand acres. Uh, and he puts it all into the uh, solar project and all of this, the land, the thousand acres is used. Um, that 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 family is going to receive a million dollars a year, every year for 35 years. Now, the fair market value of that land is probably around 8,000 bucks, maybe $10,000. Um, so uh, they have land that, that currently is worth you know, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars. Let's just, you know, it's a big range, but there's a big range out there, um, and it's going to earn, uh, 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 it's going to earn a thousand dollars an acre um, over over thirty five years. It's uh, really quite remarkable. Um, now, so that's really what the. Um, the solar economics look like. Now, there's a bit of a nuance there that um, I slipped in, which is upon commencement of construction. So prior to that, there's usually a de minimis option payment. Uh, so the solar operator can keep the land tied up for five, six, seven years. Um, and it, sometimes it's a one-time payment. Sometimes it's a payment for a number of years. And then there's follow-on payments. So there's a lot of variability in the uh, option payment structure. But fundamentally, there's some sort of you know, relatively de minimis payment, and um, upon the commencement of construction, uh, then the uh, the larger thousand dollars per um, acre rent starts to kick in. So, really, you know, thinking about risks, the main risk that the the landowner has when he enters into one of these is tying their land up for five, six, seven years prior to the commencement of construction. And why does the solar operator want five, six, seven years? It's because that's how long it takes. So um, it's not it's not great news, uh, but in order to get into the queue, to get on the transmission line, in order to get your, your local permits, your state permits, your federal permits, uh, in order to roll up the land that's not yours, that's your 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 uh, your neighbors. I mean, realistically, uh, you are looking at five years and um, uh, and an investment of a, several million dollars on the part of the solar operator. Now, that's the economics associated with um, if I did the deal with the solar operator. What's my alternative? Well, the alternative is fairly easy to analyze because the alternative is the status quo. So we know a lot about the status quo. And um, uh, not only that, but there's a lot of uh, very visible um, statistics and information about the economics of uh, agriculture in America. So the easiest thing to think about is there's two basic groups. There's three groups I want to talk about eventually. One group are people who own land and lease the land to other farmers. So um, they own land, they may or may not live in the area, uh, and they lease their land every year to a, a tenant farmer. Um, that's about half of the acres uh, in uh, the Midwest. So um, it's it's a very significant part of the overall equation. Um, usually the landowners are kind of local. Um, sometimes they're very local. Sometimes they live there. They're you know the retired school teachers that just bought land and you know taught in the local schools for thirty years and you, know, you have their house on the farm and own the farmland and lease the land. Other times. It's just multi-generational land that was owned 100 years ago by a family. The family's long gone. They live in New York City or Chicago or, or someplace, but they, you know, they have this emotional attachment to this inheritance, uh, uh, but the local people don't even know who they are. 
Uh, occasionally, um, the landowners are a big corporate um, land management firm that manages uh, and or acquires property. Um, that's the landowner. The other population, the other half, are farmers who own land and they farm their own land. And um, uh, there, there's a lot of that that's half the population. Now, the third group of people I'd like to eventually talk about are the tenant farmers. It's not really the subject of this uh, this video. I'm, I'm going to kind of deal with that with the more social and the uh, evaluation of videos, videos three and four. Um, but um, but they they are a, a very important um, consideration in, um, in in what to do. Um, so a thousand dollars. How much does the landowner that doesn't farm their land but just leases the land? How much do they um, how much do they get in rent? Well, that number is very visible because the U.S. The Department of Agriculture tracks that number, and um, it's right here on my screen, Indiana cash rent county estimates, 2022 U.S. Department of Agriculture. Right there's the link. So uh, just go hit the link yourself and you'll find that um, this uh, rent is tracked by, by county. Um, and um, just taking some representative county uh, land with kind of lesser quality um, Productivity, a buck fifty-five an acre, uh, relatively high productivity, two hundred and thirty-six dollars an acre, um, and on average, the statewide in Indiana, which we're using as our case study, uh, is two hundred nine dollars an acre. So, if I own land, I'm leasing it to a tenant farmer. On average, uh, that I should expect to get two hundred nine dollars an acre in twenty twenty two. That number is relatively static. So, so that number does not gyrate up and down uh, with the same volatility that the um, underlying um, commodity, uh, the grain commodity market does. So it does, it does move over time. Um, I don't really want to, it's beyond the scope of this video, how it moves, but, but I, my general, the observation is a, it's a cash flow stream that sometimes goes up, rarely goes down, uh, and rarely keeps up with inflation. It's my own observation. Um, so the more the more difficult piece of this to parse back is if you're a farmer and you own your own land, how much money did you make? Let's just talk about 2022 and the expectations for 2023. 2022 was a, an amazing year as far as revenue went, um, and it was generally viewed as a good year in, in farming. Um, it was a relatively high risk year because the cost of goods sold were very high. It was offset by very high revenue at the end of the day. And, um, you know, people uh, farming their own land uh, achieved uh, approximately $233 per acre in contribution margin. So what do I mean by contribution margin? I mean, they achieved $233 an acre revenue minus cost of goods sold uh, before um, any cost of the land. Uh, they own the land, but sometimes they have a mortgage on the property or debt service and you know they, the, the land um, should attract some return. Um, before their cost of machinery uh, or labor. So kind of a note, because I hear this all the time, you know, we made $500 an acre. Well, yeah, on very high productivity soil, there could be a contribution margin of $500 an acre. It's just uh, flows right through the spreadsheet pretty straightforwardly. But let's, I'm just talking about the sober moment on average cases here we're seeing in Indiana as reported by the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture. Um, so, un unfortunately, there is labor and, um, 
uh, and machinery cost, et cetera. So if you take the contribution margin and you back out the cost of machinery and you back out the cost of labor, you're, you, you know, we're calling that the net return to land, which I, I personally view as the most operative metric here. And in 2022 in Indiana, it was $20 an acre on average for average productivity um, soil uh, acreage. So um, to you kind of, you can look at it as if you owned your land and rented it, someone else should make $209. If you farmed it yourself, you'd make the $209 plus the $20 net return to land. Um, okay. So let's think about 2023. And again, I'm going with the numbers that are a month old. I don't expect they've changed. Um, we're talking about 2023 expectations and kind of the March timeframe. And Purdue is forecasting production costs, you know, break even cost of $5 and $53 an acre. It's the second highest in history. And um, it is um, only, uh, only higher year was last year. Um, Purdue estimated um, so, so that's, you know, that's a, um, that, you know, that's a very big, that's a very big number. Now, the, um, I'm just looking at this number over here, bear with me. Yeah, you know, I'm quoting live data here now, so I'm kind of out of the, so at harvest time, the forward Chicago Board of Trade number for corn is $571 a bushel. Now, I'm just going to do some math here, if you don't mind, 571. Let's just say that there's another 20 cents necessary off of that market quoted price to it's called basis differential, you will, or you can look at it as the cost to get the corn to the trading location or the friction cost of doing the trade or however you want to look at it. Let's just call that 20, 20 cents. So that means the, 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 the farmer could expect to get, based on the commodity markets that just closed a few minutes ago, 571 bucks. Uh, that's five dollars and seventy-one cents. Um, it's annoying habit of uh, commodity traders. They quote out of uh, you know they quote units that don't make any sense. Um, so uh, five five dollars seventy-three cents minus twenty cents is five dollars and um, fifty-three cents. Now. You know, that number seems pretty close, pretty close to that $553 an acre break, break even cost. And so there's two or three other things going on here. And the first is the cost of corn today for delivery today is lower than it was at harvest time of 2023. And the expectation the forward cost of corn is lower still than it was at the beginning of the year. And that's really what you're seeing on this black uh, um, chart on my, uh, on my, on my paper. Um, so that's not very helpful. Uh, the other thing that's not very helpful is that um, there's a chance, there's a 25% probability that the price of corn at harvest time in Indiana, um, well, no, the price of corn on the Chicago Board of Trade, the, the trading contract, will be at $4.37 at harvest time. That it comes right from the University of Illinois Farm Doc Farm Tool uh, Price Distribution Tool. This is a very, very useful tool. Um, if, if I was making my, my living um, growing corn or soybeans, I don't think I could help 
but look at that price distribution tool every every day. Um, and what it's going to tell you is not what the expected value is, but what the range of values are. So let's say, for example, you say, I want to be aware of the 25% case on the upside. So, so I, you know, 50% is my expected value, 75% is my upside case, and 25%. So there's a 25% probability that the downside case will be, be realized. And that number for this year at the time I checked it, uh, printed this out, was $4.37. Now, the issue with $4.37 is it's a lot lower than $5.53 or break-even cost. And I think when I go look at other indicators of farmer sentiment, the Purdue Center for um, Commercial Agriculture does publish the, their, their monthly barometer of farmer sentiment. So if you want to ask yourself, why is farmer sentiment a little down in the dumps? Um, even though corn prices are seemingly very high and last year was seemingly a very good year, it's because people are worried about this and they, they should be worried about it. It's, it's in fact worrisome. Um, so the next little chart here is the chart right from the Purdue uh, analysis of what the um, break-even costs are for, the, uh, for this, the, this forecast year, 2023 and last year in green and then the prior years. And you'll notice that the uh, uh, break-even costs have gone up dramatically uh, last year and this year relative to the historical norm. And that, in fact, is true. It's driven by the high price of oil and the high price of, um, of, of fertilizers. Uh, the fertilizer supply chain was interrupted um, globally uh, with the war in Ukraine and COVID and other factors, and it hasn't quite equalized yet. And, and probably uh, you could very well need new new production to come online that's not in the Ukraine and Russia um, to uh, to get the, that um, fertilizer cost back, back in, in the zip code where it needs to be. Um, now, the other thing that's worth noting, and certainly we're talking about landowners making a decision over that's going to be a 35-year forward-looking decision. So I do think it's it's worth it's worth it's worth considering um, the dynamics of, of corn in, uh, in, in America. And there's two, there's two troubling uh, features to the forward-looking volume of corn sales in America. So obviously, if the amount of corn demand goes down, the price is going to go down. Um, and so... For, for several years, one of the factors that uh, buoyed um, the price of corn from going down was international sales. And unfortunately, I mean, it looks to me like we've kind of lost that battle. And um, that's the chart here with the red line and the blue line. The, the red line are the commies. So that's Russia. I guess the Ukraine's not a commie anymore, but that's... Uh, that's Argentina, Brazil, South Africa, um, Russia, uh, and the Ukraine, kind of the, the big international producers of corn. And the blue line is us. And we're, we're just we're just we're just losing that international market share. And um, I don't know what could happen that would change that. Uh, I guess we could get our fertilizer costs under control and and there are there are there are things, and I'm not a farm um, economist or agriculture economist. Um, uh, I do know we have low natural gas costs too. So uh, relative to the world, we could make more fertilizer here. Um, the other troubling thing is um, ethanol. And, and I think this is important to have a conversation about for, for two reasons. One are kind of the more social issues surrounding this uh, uh, conversation, which I'm going to address in videos three and four. But as we sit here today, looking back over our shoulder in 2022, and we look at our case study of Indiana, and we look at our case uh, uh, acre of corn, 
47% of all Indiana corn went to ethanol production last year. So when I hear people say, we grow food here, we don't want your solar panels, I'm like, what are you talking about? You're, 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 yeah, you're 50% of the corn's going to food, but 50% of it's going to energy anyway. And, oh, by the way, if I have an acre and I grow corn to put in the ethanol plant to make energy, I make $209 an acre. If I have an acre to grow solar energy and put it in the electricity wires, I make $1,000 an acre. So I don't know. I'd rather be in the growing electricity business than the growing corn business for ethanol. But the more troubling issue there um, isn't really the philosophical one. Uh, it's the fact that if EVs get the penetration that they apparently are headed toward, and, you know, I've got a big old gas guzzling truck out front here, so, you know, I'm not driving an EV myself anytime soon, but it certainly looks that's the way it's it's headed. Um, geez, uh, you know, we're going to lose, we're going to lose part of that important market share. It's going to go down every year. I was listening to the must have been the March um, Center for um, Agriculture uh, webinar, um, which are wonderful things to do. I'd certainly also, if I was a farmer, besides checking the farm doc tool every day, I'd, I'd, I'd watch those I'd watch those um, webinars every every month when they come out too. Um, but there was an acknowledgement that ethanol, ethanol, uh, 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 production in America has probably peaked. Um, now what's not peaked the consumption of electricity. So, so that's, that's really, that's really not a, not a concern at all. So let's just kind of keep, keep focused on the numbers here and just recap. And uh, we'll kick the key in down the road to the videos uh, three and four, where we talk about kind of the social issues around this this whole thing, which are hugely important and, and really overwhelmingly um, determine the outcome of what people choose to do. So it's immensely important to have the conversation. And then video four will be okay. We've talked about the social issues. We've talked about the economics. Now let's put in place a framework so we can analyze this and maybe tee up a conversation for our family and our community and um, be able to explain, be able to determine what we want to do and be able to frame it in a way that we can explain to other people who are important to us why we chose that path forward. Um, but wrapping up the numbers, Really pretty clear. Thousand dollars an acre with the solar project, two hundred and nine dollars an acre renting it for corn. The economics are a little better than the two hundred nine dollars if you're self farming. So if you're farming your own land, maybe I'm just going to be kind. Um, maybe it's three hundred dollars an acre that you're making. Now, it's a little higher than what the numbers actually came out with. But anyway, $209, $300, $400, all those numbers are a mile away from $1,000 an acre. Um, and that really is the uh, economic equation. I have to say one more thing. When I go look at the farm doc tool, I go look at the volatility uh, you'll look at the increased cost of good sales and the increased risk uh, that the um, that resulted in increased volatility, which resulted in increased risk to uh, to farmers that even more than they've historically been used to. And I compare that to a revenue stream, the thousand dollars. Not only is a thousand dollars a lot more than two hundred nine dollars, but once that solar developer builds his project. He's got three hundred thousand dollars of equipment on your acre. I'm just going to do the math. So, kind of two hundred million divided by. Well, maybe it's only two hundred thousand dollars an acre, but he has two hundred thousand dollars an acre of equipment on your on your land. Uh, he's he's going to pay the rent. 
The other issue is just another kind of thing to consider. Rent as a percentage of total revenue for these solar guys um, is about uh, two to four percent. So it's not a big cost um, relative to uh, their, their revenue. Um, it's certainly an important cost uh, because um, the solar projects or the wind plants cost so much money, the $200,000 an acre, they have to generate a lot of cash to pay back the investors, the, the bank and the, um, the other institutional investors that gave them that money. Um, so, but in any event, there's no, there's no equation. There's no circumstance where um, the, the project fails to pay its rent. If you go look at rental history over the life of these wind and solar projects, I mean, there is a very, very, very small um, loss history. And I know a little bit about that because I ran a business that um, bought um, these revenue streams. So from the wind farms, from the solar plant, like I would, I would buy those revenue streams and I'm very well aware of what our loss history was, which was, which was almost zero. Um, so anyway, I hope this has been helpful uh, if you're a landowner. Um, I hope it's been helpful uh, if you're a farmer. I'm going to tee this up at some point and make the connection for the tenant farmers because um, it's important to consider uh, their interest in, as, as well. And, um, and helpful to uh, community leaders as they think about what's the proper thing for their, their town. Uh, and um, and at least understand why their constituents want to consider this. Um, and um, and and maybe even helpful to to solar developers who uh, um, I claim you know should should pay a lot of attention to what their counterparts are thinking. Um, Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you found it useful. The information uh, I uh, went through here is available on my webpage, uh, cchinkley.com, and uh, I will have it um, uh, in the um, uh, in the YouTube uh, comment section as well. Thank you.